This is a little partisan what we're doing here. We try to get all the technology going. At this point, we can see one of the participants. I hope you can hear him in a minute. At any rate, this is our third session. It's a very special session because we had an additional speaker come on who is going to be, um, I don't want to use the word additional negatively, but rather positively. He'll be adding something to the theme that we have thought organized before. Uh, if you remember the name of the conference is Extreme Inequality and Its Evils. So there are words here, both the extreme that we talked about before and the evils. I think this is the one um, session so far where we will encounter the evils. I know that Muhammad Allahi uh, told us just a few minutes ago that he's feeling hopeful and more optimistic being addressed by people working in the NGO movement. Uh, and now I think we will have to stand up to or at least encounter uh, things that are not so smoothly, or maybe it's not fair to say to the NGOs that they were smooth, but not so straightforwardly solved. Now we have two speakers with us before the additional speaker. <laughs> we have two speakers who I will introduce now. And then we will have questions and answers for them on their subjects. And afterwards, we will, I will introduce Michal Apollo, who's come to us from Krakow, who will be showing us something from a different angle, which complements what we're doing very beautifully. Our two speakers, I am introducing them formally, like everyone has done before, but uh, they are good friends of mine, so I take that <laughs> responsibility. Uh, we have Alex DeWall and Richard Connolly from the World Peace Foundation at Tufts University. Uh, they are respectively executive directors, called the Alex, executive director and research director at the World Peace Foundation. Alex is considered, I think, one of the leading experts in the world on Sudan, on the Horn of Africa. He's worked, I wrote it all down, with many uh, organizations that we've all uh, heard of before, Global Equity Initiative, I remember hearing about that years ago with Alex, um, the Social Science Research Council, the African Union Mediation Team for Darfur, the African Union High Level Implementation Panel for Sudan, that was. And, um, he works, I, I have a list of themes and subjects that I have talked with him about. You can say peace, but you can say conflict. You can say human rights, but you can say humanitarian initiatives. Um, you can say governance, and that's a different way of looking at things, of course. Uh, you've also worked on HIV AIDS. Uh, these, uh, this litany of terrible things that uh, some people take upon themselves to address and to work on. His last book is called Mass Starvation, The History and Future of Famine. And we will be hearing about starvation here, but not only. We will be hearing about that umbrella of extreme inequality and its evils. Uh, so I'll just introduce Bridget now, and that way you will both uh, go consecutively and without any instruction on my part. Bridget also works at the World Peace Foundation. Uh, she's the research director and also research professor at Tufts. Yes. So also teaching at Tufts. Um, she has concentrated, and every time I tell this to other people, Bridget, they go, wow, on um, atrocities, on um, mass atrocities. And that question of mass atrocities always raises a question in my mind because I just hear the word inequality and I think, well, there's a mass atrocity for you. But uh, Bridget will bring us more analysis and more information about what it is that we talk about when we talk about mass atrocity. She has worked before in the uh, Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. She had edited a book, How Mass Atrocities End, that deals with Guatemala, Burundi, Indonesia, 
Sudan, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Iraq, I think I've got them all down, I'm not sure. I, and again, when I look at that list, I think of the ability to stand in front or behind those things and really write about them and tell us something that can enlighten us about something like mass atrocities. Her last book is called Memory from the Margins, Ethiopia's Red Terror Martyrs Memorial Museum. I have seen a presentation on that, which cost me many hours of sleep. So again, without putting you all down right now, I think we're getting a counter part now to the optimistic session that we thought we had before. So, Alex, why don't you start? Uh, so that's it. Some of them actually inflict minor 
counted or memorialized. Let me take a case of the Iowa as an example. The, the famine in Iowa, the great famine in Iowa, or what I would call the great English famine in Iowa, was, was inflicted and was suffered between 1845 and 1841. A time, during a time when about a million people in Iowa um, died of starvation and related causes, and more than a million um, emigrated, many of them to the United States. But it took more than a hundred years before that family really began to be memorialized, before um, communal memorials, monuments were, were, were uh, erected, before historians really began to, to, to recount individual stories of what, what, what happened. Uh, everyone knew that it was no secret, but it wasn't recounted in, in, in all the sort of like horrors of, of, of action. And I would like to suggest that the reason is the following, which is that if you are undergoing this type of deprivation and, and, and starvation, absolute dispossession, and whether it's a famine or, or, or being interned in a concentration camp, if you're immediate, and particularly so actually, if you're undergoing it as a family, as a community, your most compelling experience, the thing that is really printed on your memory, the thing that you carry with you afterwards, is not that we underwent this horrible collective experience, it is actually rather is your personal experience of the shame and the indignities that you suffered and the cruelties you may have inflicted on others. So there is the starving children of your neighbour whom you turned away from the door even though you had some crusts of bread that you wanted to fed them. It's the fact that you had two children who were sick, but you had money only enough to provide this for one. It is the fact that you had a piece of land that was handed down from your grandparents and your great-grandparents, and you forfeited it, you sold it for a month. The fact that you, you, know, you were as, a, as, a, as a male head of household, were ready to see your, your wife or your daughters go and spend the night with your richer neighbor or your landlord in order for them to get a single meal. Or you know, if, if, if you're a woman that you've traded your body in this way. And the sense of, of degradation, of humiliation, and of failure, the fact that you were not able to keep your family alive, that you were, that your own children died and, and you buried them. This is what is remembered. And so people really come out of this blaming themselves. They blame that it, it, it is these minor gradients of, of inequality that become the prevailing print of memory and experience of what is happened. And it is only generations later, or when the story is retold in, a, in another way, the story is told not as this is something that was humiliating and degrading that we went through, but this was a, a crime inflicted upon us by a faraway power. It's only then that people can begin to have their, 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 their uh, dignity restored, that the, the social death that they went through, through this humiliation, etc., degradation, um, can be overcome, can, uh, can be reversed. That starvation can be seen as an act that is inflicted upon people and not just as a, 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 a suffering after God. So those very intimate inequalities are the, the, the very grist, the very foundational experience of what it is for a community or a family or a, a, indeed a nation to suffer from, um, from this kind of um, now I want to begin to convey that point. I now want to zoom out, and this is where the, the, the bigger issues of global inequality begin to come into the picture. But where I'd like to, to put up the, the, the famous 
it shows the uh, extent to which different uh, economic groupings from the poorest on the left to the richest on the right have benefited from the world's economic growth over the last 20 years. So the three things that are usually focused upon in this uh, presentation of the elephant are number one, the trunk, the trunk on the far right, the fact that a vast disproportionate proportion of uh, global economic gains, gains have gone to the cultural world to the 1%, 0.1%, but not the 0.01%, so they have enormous benefit. The other beneficiaries are the, the, those who have been pulled out of poverty into the growing middle classes of the developing world. So the big hump of the elephant, the shoulders of the elephant, that is primarily China and South Asia, so that is like, uh, some countries in Latin America, South Africa. You know, and, and growing world plants. Uh, and then between them, there's the lower point, the, uh, uh, the, the group that has not benefited, which is the, uh, those who are not the middle classes or the working classes of the developed nations, who have really not kept over the last 20 years. And these are the people who are customarily identified as those who vote for Donald Trump or for Brexit. Now, what's been neglected in this story? I don't want to dispute this story, I think this story is very compelling. But what I'm interested in is really the detail of the far left, the, the, the point at which um, on the far left you see there is a, globally speaking, a relatively small number of people, maybe the bottom 5% of people, but still hundreds of millions, but still they're not. Um, not the majority of the population, who also have the benefit. And so the question is, um, you know, who are these people? Um, you know, how long is this for? How long does it take? And I would argue that actually the, uh, the way that this tale is represented in, in um, insofar as it is from concern to economists, the way they're represented is these are the people who are left out. This is the second group of people, along with the, the, the uh, middle classes, working classes of developed nations. This is the second group of people who are sort of left out of this global world, um, who are well, being left behind, and we should, well, we should go and help them. But I wouldn't disagree with that general sentiment, but I think it's very, very precise. I think actually it's not that so much that people are being left behind or left out. So they actually been pushed down that tail. If we look at when people actually are reduced to this level where they cannot maintain themselves from day to day, they are suffering hunger and starvation. They are doing so very largely in the context of armed conflict and war in countries like Yemen, countries in the South Sudan, like Somalia, and most particularly. Countries where starvation has been deliberately inflicted upon them as a method of war or a means of social control. So, the Rohingya of Myanmar, the besieged on the face of, of, of Syria, where um, in, let's say, in, in the enclave of Eastern Ghouta until, until it was overrun by the Syrian government forces, the price of a loaf of bread was six. Times higher than it was in uh, the, the city of, of Damascus, literally just one mile away. Just one mile and a 16 year old increase in the price of a, 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 a basic commodity. Or cases like northeastern Nigeria, which we can't really hear about, where in the name of counter terrorists in Nigeria, army supported by the US and UK and others, is essentially starving out the enclave of. Territory controlled by the, uh, the extremist group, of course, the more easily 
Maurice in a court, uh, promoted a court, where we had, uh, uh, in, in response to proposals for a wealth tax, we had eminent liberal economists said, oh, a wealth tax will never work because the rich will always manage to escape. Well, that's it. Not at all. Take that serious effort. But somehow, the assumption that the rich are have escaped the bounds of, of, of the generative bounds of, of, of any sort of social constraint has become so pervasive that that does that it makes me ask the question, does that also validate the infliction of not only the gross inequality that these people are, but the tolerance of these microeconomic micro inequalities that that exist in this grey zone. But also related to that, the other normative and ideological element is why is it that in our world of real politics of counterterrorism we are prepared to not only to tolerate, tolerate but even to, to promote actively the kinds of political and military actions that inflict this uh, way of life and way of, of death on hundreds of thousands of companies. So let me conclude with those rather uh, uh, dismal questions. Okay. Thank you.
So the first one is perhaps the most obvious to think of equality in terms of whether or not there's a correlation between income inequality or other forms of economic inequality and risk for mass atrocities. Thus far, the literature does not seem to find that there is a correlation, largely because inequality is measured in many countries at the national level. And so the mere fact of having extreme inequality does not correlate with risk of what is actually a fairly rare phenomenon of mass atrocities, which I'm going to define as widespread and systematic assaults against civilians. In this case, I think we'll blur the lines of whether or not they're targeted by group identity or just a, a broader category of assaults against civilians. There's been some work that looks on whether or not we can find out more if we moved below the national level, so looked at relative um, deprivation or at economic discrimination. But here again, then, we are talking about the role of the state in giving privilege to one group over another and how that might relate to the possibility of mass atrocities. There's probably more work that could be done in that area, but as I noted, so far, there doesn't seem to be many instances of correlation. What you have instead, what really triggers this exceptional, and we'll come back to this concept as well, exceptional campaigns of violence, um, is how a state itself perceives its sense of responsibility to the diversity of its population, particularly when it comes under an acute threat to its own stability, which is generally the context of armed conflict. There is more research and work that could be done in that vein. But I wanted to switch and rather than talk about inequality as an empirical factor, to think of it as a conceptual framework as well. So every assertion of inequality is also an assertion of equality. But you're saying that there are things that should be able to be brought together, and the reference to inequality is drawing attention to the ways in which inequality does not realize in practice. When we shift to think about this in relation to mass atrocities, and I'll give three examples of where I think this plays out, I think we need a second concept, which is that of asymmetry, which is things that are brought into close proximity where it can be revealed that they are actually different. So in the first instance, right, is um, what might be deemed an inequality, but I think is really an asymmetry between civilians and armed actors, whether they be a state or a militia. And I will give this the somewhat um, simplistic headline, right, of killing is bad. Um, the very definition of mass atrocities assumes a core asymmetry between the capacity for protection and for harm between those who are armed and those who are not. And it is, in fact, the, reason, the, the, the fact that these two categories of people are so dissimilar that we have the moral judgment that mass atrocities are evil, right? that they have that component of being exceptional. It's not an asymmetric war where you have sides that fight in different ways or are differently armed. They are actually of two very different categories. This is the model of violence that we've seen in genocides passed by a much more narrow definition, right? So the Holocaust, for instance, right, where the asymmetry was, was extraordinary and overwhelming. We could go back earlier to think of the assault against the Herrera in colonial Germany or other colonial cases. The Armenian genocide. Um, the Cultural Revolution, right, to take a political group or the Khmer Rouge regime's um, policies. Um, I think the Guatemalan genocide is also one, although there was an armed group, the asymmetry of force against Guatemala um, would fall into this category. Today, though, what we find are that mass atrocities are just as likely, if not more likely, to occur, although still with enormously high losses. And in countries where that strong central authority, so state power, is much more highly contested, right, with a weaker state that cannot control and totally dominate um, a battlefield. Now, this 
So for instance here, think of Democratic Republic of Congo, right? Or think of Iraq post-2003. Um, in these cases, atrocities occur as multiple armed groups commit violence against various, or a wide range, of civilian groups. The complications introduced by these multi-sided conflicts does not diminish the degree to which one might nonetheless recognize the evil of those asymmetric assaults against civilians. And nor does it absolve analysts or policymakers from making political assessments about who is more responsible for causing that harm. But it does complicate response. Now, my third category, right, so the sort of economic inequality, the core asymmetry between categories of civilian and armed actors, um, is the asymmetry, I would argue, between recognition of the evil of those atrocities and the assumption that response is good. Um, so even if we can, in these complex situations, identify those kinds of assaults, right? And we're talking mostly about killing, although some of the cases that we bring up would echo the means of targeting through mass starvation that Alice has also spoken about. Um, these have been argued, right, under the label of mass atrocities as exceptional violence. So violence that causes enough of a rift within the otherwise deemed prerogatives of sovereignty as to command or even really to demand an exceptional response. Starting with maybe economic or diplomatic measures, but moving all the way up and through logic, rationale for coercive armed intervention. That's the discourse we use, but that's also a word of war, right? It's conducting war. But too often, the conversation about when and how to advocate for such measures is premised on slippage between recognition of the extreme evil of the harm and assumption that that endows that response mechanisms with a parallel and opposite categorization of good. These are, in fact, again, in my use of these terms, asymmetric. Recognizing the one does not automatically mean that the response measure um, falls into the same simple but opposite moral category. However, what we've seen in the field of mass atrocities prevention is a sense that the only inequality here is the unequal application of coercive measures. Right? But the problem when applying different measures um, is not in the tools themselves, but it might be in a failure to amp up the tools equal to the degree of evil perpetrated in mass atrocities. I would say, though, as I've said now a few times, that these are actually non-identical. And you can start to see this as well in the record, though, of how these tools have actually performed in terms of damping down or changing dynamics. So across the board, there have been studies of when we apply economic sanctions, whether targeted or more comprehensive, of the value of naming and shaming and keeping perpetrators, or those accused of perpetrating, perpetrating crimes, from attending international fora, um, and also of the more extreme sort of coercive, whether it's in a fly zone, military limited sanctions, or going all the way up to intervention. Um, also, legal measures that would be another one of these tools within the toolbox. But what is found across the board where people try to study these comprehensively and their effectiveness um, to stopping or halting or changing patterns of mass atrocities is that they're extremely context specific. None of them works well across the board in any situation. Um, that the tools. Um, that there is, there is across the board a lack of correlation on the tool side on what each one of these can do. 
However, and this is where the story gets slightly more complicated, across the same time period, right, so starting in the early 2000s, really, where you had a stronger research side and also policy and advocacy side, trying to develop these tools and spending lots of energy on when it's okay and how do you define the exceptional situation to trigger, to trigger application of these tools. For a long time, about 10 years, there was a decline in the number of mass atrocity events and also the scale of killing that occurred in them. And there is the paradox that I wanted to get to, is we cannot pin that decline to the efficacy of any one tool, nor really any combination of tools, even though it's apparent at this large macro level. Up until about 2012, um, where you start to see all the indicators of violence starting to rise again. What I would argue is that the greatest contribution of the anti-atrocities movement was not in creating very specific guidelines for policy, but rather it was to cultivate international awareness of violence against civilians as being criminal, unnecessary, and punishable act. So another way to say this is that the international discussions about preventing and responding to atrocities was more powerful than any of the tools that the field developed. Ironically, part of that discussion was driven by the search for refining tools up to and until Libya. Following the intervention in Libya, um, where there is such a strong backlash to intervening in the name of protecting, which expanded then became regime change, where more people were killed in the conflict that followed the intervention than had been killed before it was, um, it was launched, was that the entire uh, paradigm of uh, the UN responsibility to protect, but elsewhere of atrocities prevention was then tarnished. Um, and so then the fourth area, um, and here I want to switch from thinking about things that are viewed as inequalities that I'm saying are actually asymmetries. This I'd like to switch to talk about something that I think has been deemed by the atrocity response field as an asymmetry, that is things that don't fit that category of exceptional violence, and to say that it's worth now turning to try to understand how there might actually be more linkages or more, maybe not equalities, um, of concern between a wider array of forms of violence and locations of violence. Um, so if we can see that the strongest part of the protection regime was actually building what I would call this larger fabric of, prote of protection, that is a conversation and engagement with broadening audiences about the value and the possibilities of making achievements in protecting civilians from widespread harms. Then we face a different challenge today when the entire paradigm has really come under extreme, um, it's extremely vulnerable now, and possibly some would say are to be irrelevant at this point. What can be reconstructed from these ruins of multilateralism that existed in previous decades? I would argue that you can't go back to that exceptionalism, guiding exceptional tools, but rather the challenge today is to think how would you build a politics of protection that is united by principles, even if they require specific rethinking and calibration for specific context. So what would this mean? It might mean treating different types of violence within a category of that which demands that we pay attention and change policy in order to halt it. So this means breaking down some of the stove pipes between mass atrocities and genocide and what's often called criminal violence. Um, on the international level, if you think of this, of where are mass atrocities most likely to happen, right, the map lights up in parts of Africa and the Middle East. If you add in the where are most people being killed, being murdered through armed violence, Latin America suddenly pops up, right? Central America as well. If you pull it down into cities where people are being high, killed at the highest rates, 
you'll even start to see some American cities. Chicago, I think, is third on the uh, highest, um, not third overall, but th um, third among American cities that appear on um, cities with the highest homicide rates. We also have um, New Orleans. Right? There are places within the United States where there is violence that is occurring, not in the same patterns, with the same actors necessarily, but with a challenge to those of us who want to think about protection, with the same moral urgency to declare it as unacceptable. And there are ways that people are doing this, and we can talk about those in question and answer if people are interested. But for me, at least coming to this conference and the Knox invitation, and also my students' confrontations and constant challenges, is a real challenge to think how do we view all these different types of violence together and try to, to reduce the number that are deemed acceptable.
our view of who the violence is being committed against, if in that place. So I do want to butt in now, because my, my question is very um, similar and different from Alex's. Uh, Alex, we have another Alex here, that's why. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we, we heard in the session before about a certain correlation between inequality and poverty, uh, which is very, very elusive. And it wasn't clear yet exactly how they are measuring that. But now that both of you have spoken, I'm thinking really semantically, and maybe this is too abstract, but when I hear the word atrocity, and then I put that together with what Alex, Alex DeWall said about uh, people dying of hunger or famine, or, or what was the word, starvation, and, and uh, Alex, I've heard you make a uh, distinction between those three. Um, and now you put in the word violence. Is there something violent about letting people die of hunger or even starving them? And there, of course, I would see violence. And then what happens is that inequality itself becomes a mass atrocity. So I, I think that goes with this question. We're trying to what, f find all of these similarities or differences or correlations, but the words we're using have such deep meanings. And, and when I think of how you define atrocity and put it together with what Alex said about letting people die, which is this far away from causing people to die, that aren't we then engaging in mass atrocities by um, condoning, accepting uh, inequality at the level at which we're now encountering inequality. So I know that's, I, I'm sorry if that's not convoluted, but all these words are really <laughs> landing on my head with a lot of pain. Yeah, Matt. I actually have a similar question to Jordan. Um, you're talking about types of violence, as opposed to what the question was, yes, like active or passive violence or experience, and doing it just in terms of objective or subjective violence and like different ways of recognizing or refusing to recognize the object of violence and how that sort of affects the level of I don't say level of atrocity at different scales, but is it an atrocity in passively or letting these people die or an atrocity in actively making these people die? Okay. One last piece and then there's the book by um, Thomas, why did it come up? Uh, Stephen Pinker's book, The Better Nature is Our Better Nature, something. Uh, he had this fantastic argument how we have, as humankind, become less violent. He has all these statistics. Less people are dying, they're not dying as actively or whatever. And, and again, I, when you ask, you ask that, I, I say to myself, what is he talking about? And he's talking about. attention to the group 
that is down below them, that somehow it's going to diminish their ability to survive, being, of course, thinking in terms of survival on a, on a different level, uh, that is prosperity and, you know, uh, whatever they have, that, that playing those politics uh, increasingly, perhaps, uh, throughout the world, is, is one of those, those elements that could potentially uh, be used as justification or, or, or find so big a resonance among societies that otherwise uh, might not have been as receptive to, uh, to those kinds of um, you know, um, uh, characterizations. I wonder what you think. Shelter, blankets, health care. 
where she's sort of killed as a socially relevant person first before physical death. So I'd love to get that citation though from the one that you mentioned. And we're not live streaming it anyway, are we? Okay. The other thing is, I know so many people yeah. who are teaching. It's, it's only recording. It's recording. Okay. okay. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, and a lot of people who are teaching in prisons, and like, you know, one faculty member, then there's only like one step away before you know someone else <laughs> who's done it. Um, and to me, it feels like there's kind of a, there must be a reservoir. There are people who have, all right now, because of the need to maintain relationships with departments and corrections, most of that work goes into increasing um, educational opportunities in prison. I feel like this, and I know there are other groups that are doing another array of work, but yeah, I'm hoping that all of us will change some things out of that as well. I mean, some of them were really hard. <laughs> like the um, Alex, I thought actually you might do well with family to talk about the difference between sort of an active and passive killing, and how those are viewed differently, uh, particularly with famine.
be able to emancipate them from that indignity and shame to say, it wasn't your fault, you didn't bring this on yourself. It's not your failure, it's, it's somebody else's crime. No, I was just going to say briefly on the economic inequality and whether that relates to tolerance um, for violence. Um, I'm not sure that it's merely economic inequality. In the U.S. it's always race um, and inequality that comes along with that. And then, but there's also been a shift and you probably have seen it in students or peers as well, that the towards channeling social justice movements of a certain elite towards um, depoliticized or discourse, the human rights discourse, I mean essentially the, the core critique of human rights discourse, right? that is a depoliticizing one, or at least the way that it has been, the way that it's channeled and funded and professionalized in practice today, um, and away from other types of viewing social emancipation and protection and change. Um, and I mean, that's, that's out there. There's lots of people who are writing and thinking um, about that. But in the international context, so even if we're not looking at domestic in my area of, of protection, it's also then this uh, crisis-driven response to the world. And so a lot of research that's done on atrocities kind of like how can we identify the places that are most at risk of the worst kind of atrocity so that we can channel our attention there so we know how to stop the thing that's most rare rather than sort of more holistic view of, of what's going on. And there are lots of things that can fuel and continue to drive that really crisis and emergency driven approach to international affairs. Are the atrocities committed by large powers, the United States, for example, going into other countries and massively killing people. I mean, how many weddings has the U.S. fought in Afghanistan alone? Right? And it's just ridiculous. Uh, not to speak of the Vietnam War, the Korean War, and the volatility of wars, uh, the bit of Russia, and so on. So we live in a world in which it is completely acceptable for the powerful to pursue their political aims by violent means and killing a few hundred people, a few hundred thousand people, a few million people is just par for the course. That is just sometimes you can't put an omelet without breaking the hands. So you didn't bring this in much in your contributions here and so the last thing, that's why I'm saying this, uh, the last thing you said was sort of the we, the responsible countries, the United States, international law, the international community, the euphemism for us Western civilized folks, and what can we do about atrocities? And I wanted to give a bit of a counterpoint to that and say, you know, so long as we hold ourselves ready to commit these unspeakable, large-scale, enormously large-scale atrocities uh, in comparison to which the FARC is just a joke, uh, can we really expect that the little guys will not also pursue their political goals by violent means? I'm not in any way justifying it, but I'm saying is there some causal connection and what can we do we really want to get violence out of this world as a means for achieving political ends. Don't we have to think about the smaller scale atrocities in connection with the large scale ones committed by the G5, let's say, the Security Council? Yeah. Well, there is an enormous problem with study of atrocity. Because some of the powers book is sort of the signature example. Um, which didn't look at very many different cases, and certainly not any where the U.S. was aligned with. I mean, not even Guatemala, which to me is a fairly straightforward one, let alone cases in which the U.S. was the primary perpetrator. But it also goes back to how political scientists also study interventions. And so all of the colonial interventions, many of them are often not studied in terms of third-party interventions and how that relates to conflict duration. And so I, I would just basically I would agree with you 100 percent 
Um, and, and part of improving, even just a more traditionally understood mass atrocities is widespread systematic violence against civilians during armed conflict, is taking in a larger purview of cases and understanding the complications and implications of intervention. It's like in the Endings Project that Anat um, referenced, um, one part of that was qualitative case studies. We have another one that's like quantitative, it's like 40 cases. So it's small n. But looked at what was the role of outside interventions and outside withdrawals in terms of decreasing violence. And what we found was that in many cases, the withdrawal of armed international forces contributed to the decline of mass atrocities. And so if that's the case, then it turns that whole paradigm upside down. Um, but I think that some of it actually comes from universities as well. We have to study and understand and put things that are deemed in different universes together into the same universe. And that's the first step, I think, at least from where we sit, where we, meaning people who work in universities, sit. Well, I think I, uh, I was apologizing ahead of time at this not being a very happy session, but I think the end at least gives us a thought to thinking differently. And Thomas, I've heard this from you so many times. Uh, how can we think differently? In other words, challenge some presuppositions that are there in the discourse outside so automatically that you have to do a lot of work, first of all, to get people to talk a different language about these things. So I do thank you very much for that. Thank, thank you. you.